Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Peretti, and I'd like to welcome you as we discuss interprofessional practice, or IPP, as it relates to the scope of practice for audiologists. According to ASH's definition, IPP occurs when multiple service providers from different professional backgrounds provide comprehensive services by working with individuals and their families, caregivers, and communities to deliver the highest quality of care across healthcare and educational settings. Considering the scope of practice for audiology, uh, the types of inter interprofessional relationships that are essential are relationships that promote sharing of information, communication, uh, solving problems, and also setting goals. Uh, developing these type of relationships will, allow, will hopefully allow us to uh, improve the quality of life for our patients. So when we're talking about audiologist scope of practice, that usually involves four distinct areas. The first one is identifying hearing loss. The second one is evaluation for people who have been identified as possibly having hearing loss. The third is prevention of hearing loss. And the fourth is treatment of hearing loss. And in each of those different areas in our scope of practice, there are a wide variety of other professionals who we would be working with in order to have the optimum outcomes for our patients. There are many types of relationships and environments where audiologists will work with other professionals, creating interprofessional practice scenarios. Audiologists may work with other professionals in uh, medical or health and also education settings. Um, in the health setting, uh, medical setting, uh, audiologists work with physicians, nurses, uh, speech language pathologists, and also other rehab services. Um, in the education setting, audiologists may collaborate with uh, special ed teachers, uh, speech language pathologists, um, occupational therapists, and also physical therapists. Well, hospital settings and, and hospital clinic settings are probably a major one um, in that in ear, nose, and throat doctors and audiologists are typically on the same floor or in the same area so that they can collaborate on what, what is the best diagnos diagnosis and treatment for a given patient, whether they be a, an infant, a child, an adult, a teenager at any age. Lots of audiologists are in private practice and they work with uh, general practitioners, they work with pediatricians, and they work with ENTs in that regard too. A lot of communication, they may not be on the same room with them, but a um, lot of communication with them. Most of the time we think about identifying hearing loss in, for newborns in a hospital. So the people we would need to be working with in the hospital are first of all the hospital administrators to make sure that they have an appropriate protocol for screening for hearing loss. We'd also be training volunteers, working with nurses, perhaps pediatric otologists who might be called in, and particularly particularly the pediatricians, um, they're going to be the ones who are going to be getting some of the results. And they need to know how to disseminate that information to the uh, centers who are going to be following up on the children who we've identified as possibly having hearing loss, what the next steps would be. Historically, one of the major relationships, interprofessional relationships we've had in audiology has been with the ear, nose, and throat physician group. For example, some individuals with hearing loss have a type of hearing loss that can be treated with medicine or surgery, and other individuals have a different type of hearing loss that needs to be treated with hearing aids or uh, communication strategies, training, many other things that are non-medically or surgically um, involved. We also work in balance disorders, we work in uh, tinnitus disorders. Uh, people with balance disorders, we're, look, we're working with physical therapists, uh, we're working with physicians. There are new tinnitus programs now because that's another kind of psychological bent that people have to deal with. So we work sometimes with psychologists as well um, because some tinnitus is just intractable. It's very difficult to deal with. Early hearing detection and intervention refers to the practice of screening every newborn for hearing loss prior to hospital discharge. This has affected teaming between school audiologists and clinical audiologists. Since the implementation of universal newborn hearing screening, there have been a couple of things that have happened. Uh, one of those is that audiologists, whether they be pediatric or clinical audiologists or school audiologists, have had to change their mindset. Um, they're now maybe dealing with children with hearing loss being their only disability. 
And so that may be a difference in the way that you would approach that child as opposed to a child that has hearing loss plus other disabilities because of that early intervention piece. And since they, the regulations to have children in school in that birth to three year period or in programs, uh, school audiologists are deeply involved in those and need to be up to date on pediatric development and all of that sort of thing. So the hearing aid dispensing audiologist or the cochlear implant dispensing audiologist and the school audiologist really do have to be in collaboration for the best needs of that child. One of the big reasons that interprofessional practice is so vital is that hearing loss affects the whole person. In our clinic here, <laughs> we have a little saying that we use and it's, it's not all about ears. It's about the whole person. And so everyone that's involved in that person's life, that child's life, their family, their other specialists they may deal with, their audiologists, really need to be aware of all the things that impact that child. Um, culturally, religiously, um, where they live, all of those things that are really important and that don't have anything to do with hearing. It's, it's clear that individuals are more than their ears. There's a lot of um, emotional uh, impact of having a hearing loss there besides the sensory deprivation. And if we, um, if we can work with other groups and look at the patient as a whole and find whatever professionals we can work together with to uh, make sure that the whole person is being addressed, that's our best chance of helping the individual we're seeing really have the highest quality of life.